So welcome this morning to our session and thank you very much for making it. I know on the first day there's lots of flights and travel and so on, so really appreciate who we have in the room. Our workshop session today is called AI, Ally or Enemy, Applications of Artificial Intelligence in Procurement and Democracy Building. And, and hopefully that gives you a good sense of welcome, we have a seat, come in, you're welcome. Yes, you're in the right space. Come on in. <laughs> <laughs> welcome, welcome. No, you walked right out. <laughs> um, great. So hopefully that gives you a sense of what we're going to talk about today. Before I get into a bit of our background, um, I do want to just mention that our session today is not focused um, on the, the back room or the, the sort of um, back end aspects of AI or digital tech. It's more about really what can we do? What are the potential applications of AI with a particular focus, um, as we say, on procurement and democracy building? And of course that phrase democracy building is not without its sort of um, contestations. So hopefully as we speak today, we'll also get a sense um, of what we mean by democracy building. Okay, so it sounds like I might have to compete with the other room a bit, but as soon as you feel like I'm shouting at you, just, uh, you know, appreciate anyone going um, if the mic gets too loud. So we have an excellent panel today that I'm very excited by. We have one of our speakers who is, has a pre-recorded input. We really wanted to have her join us. Um, and so we're excited and grateful to the organizers that that pre-recording could be done. So one thing I do want to say today is that we are aiming, people always say we want to have an interactive session and then, you know, we end up not having an interactive session. So the degree of interaction very much depends on you. <laughs> so please, as we go, really do take the space, make it yours, feel free. Um, and equally, I think we'll, we'll be more excited um, if you are kind of participating in the session. So towards the end, we will have that moment um, where we really kind of have set aside a good amount of time to hear from you, to interact, to have provocations, to raise questions, and to share some illustrative examples. Right, so why are we here today and what is the objective of our session? We are really hoping to explore some of the complexities and contradictions of the role of AI. Um, particularly in fighting corruption in public procurement, but that's not the exclusive focus. So some of the examples you'll hear um, will be around digital tools, will be around aspects of corruption or, or procurement, will be on aspects of policy formulation to some extent. Um, I'm keeping a close eye on the time just as well because one of the things that we've been told, um, and maybe to do a bit of housekeeping, which I should have started with, is that at the end, um, we do need to keep it quite tight so that at 10.30 we, we are leaving or have left the room. So I, I just wanted to put that up front in case we, we get booted out. Right, um, corruption, misinformation and disinformation continue to be quite significant threats, uh, particularly, well, across the globe. But our focus today in part is on aspects of the global south, the applications, implications um, of AI, um, some of our examples are particularly on the African context, but not solely. And so between us here, I think we will share some examples that illustrate um, those AI applications, those questions, those complexities across contexts. So recognizing both what we, what we will hopefully share today as well are some of the advantages and disadvantages of AI for human development and democracy. Um, and in particular, aspects of promoting the rule of law. It's important that we interrogate and explore innovations in digital tech that can support systemic change um, you know, for governance and accountability purposes. So that's, that's one of the aspects that we're really looking for today, um, are the links to what we particularly care about, aspects of governance, aspects of accountability. Um, one of the important advantages I think we highlight in our session today is um, the you know, AI systems and their propensity for analyzing extensive amounts of data. Procurement being one of those spaces or one of those sectors in which there's complex data systems um, and, and again, um, you know, great amounts that very much are open to um, corruption. 
So the high degree of accuracy and autonomous decision making, and that autonomous um, word is also something that strikes a bit of fear for an activist um, like myself, um, where machine learning, for instance, is concerned. But these are, these are possible advantages, um, and at the same time offer constraints um, and, and offer potentially um, disadvantages. Right, so our format today, interactive, sort of fishbowl-y setup. We're going to hear very briefly um, uh, sort of some grounding from our speakers in particular you know, illustrations or examples or questions they'll be raising. Then we will open up. All right, so our first uh, input, as I said, is from Kavisha Pillay. Um, and I'll introduce each speaker be just before they speak. Kavisha Pillay um, is from an organization called Code, based in South Africa, and we have a pre-recording of her. So we're going to play presentation number one, the video. Good morning, everyone. My name is Kavisha Pillay, and I'm the executive director of a non-profit organization in South Africa, called the Campaign on Digital Ethics, or CODE. I'm sorry that I'm not physically with you today, but I'm so very grateful for this opportunity to present some of my thoughts on how we navigate the use of AI in public procurement and other spaces. So at CODE, we focus on the nexus between technology, human rights, and democracy. And our thinking is that in order to build a safe digital future, we need to have certain guardrails and frameworks in place to ensure that the technology that we are developing is going to help promote human rights and strengthen democracy, as opposed to contributing to the further polarization that we're experiencing in our, our societies, as well as the destabilization of democratic processes. But before we get into the crux of today's conversation about whether AI is an enemy or an ally, I thought that it's necessary to explain some basic concepts of AI. So put simply, AI is a form of computer science that is dedicated to creating machines that can perform tasks which typically require human intelligence. It can recognize speech, it can identify objects in pictures and patterns in data, it helps with decision making, and it can solve problems. But it's important to note what AI is not. So AI is not conscious. Unlike humans, it is not self-aware and does not have emotions. So it operates based on algorithms and data without any feelings or personal experiences influencing its decision making. It is also not inherently intelligent. So AI's intelligence is derived from the data fed into it and the algorithms written by humans. It does not possess any innate knowledge or understanding, but it instead learns from patterns. So instead of thinking of it as intelligence, it's essentially just processing knowledge, it's processing data and information that's fed into it and then being able to provide a response to the user. And where we are today is we are, since the launch of ChatGPT by OpenAI, what's essentially happened is that we are in an AI arms race where tech companies all over the world are introducing new large language models, which can be quite concerning, especially given that there are very limited regulations governing how these models are developed and deployed for human consumption, use and interaction. There's only a few places in the world at the moment, it's just the European Union that's introduced the AI Act, but in other countries across the world, there's been very limited um, movement in terms of creating regulations that are progressive and that ensures that AI is built within a human rights framework. So going back to today's question is, I was thinking about, is it a simple black and white choice about whether AI is um, a friend or an enemy? And in thinking about this, I think we've opened Pandora's box. So there'll never be a point in our reality where AI does not exist. The technology 
will keep getting better and more sophisticated as time goes on. And then when we think about whether we use AI or don't use AI, I'm not necessarily sure if we have a clear, if it is a clear black or white question, or if there's this middle ground that we are going to have to use. Again, because we are not going to be able to put the genie back into the bottle. AI is here to stay. How do we find a way to use AI that will help to enable and strengthen our society and systems and not have the opposite effect. And I think what we can use, or in thinking about this, what we can use or refer to um, is Aristotle. And I'm going back to a bit of um, philosophy and ethics here because I think a lot about how we develop AI in an eth within an ethical framework. But basically, Aristotle's golden mean, mean theory helps us to think about finding a balance between two extremes in order to achieve a virtuous outcome. So in the case of, for example, public procurement, because that's what we're talking about today, the extremes could be... Um, excessive dependence on AI, so completely automating the procurement process, relying solely on AI without any human oversight. And, you know, some of the pros that you could see on this is, um, you know, potentially some high efficiency, um, perhaps reduced human error, maybe some elimination of bias in theory. Um, the cons would be, you know, accountability issues, potential for hidden biases within the models that's developed by AI and reduced human judgment and discretion. But then in terms of deficiency, you could have a complete rejection of AI. So refusing to use AI at all and maintaining a fully manual procurement process. And some of the pros obviously is, you know, there's human oversight, there's greater accountability, there's being able to understand nuance, being able to understand context and environment, which is sometimes difficult when you're building these large language models. Um, so again, this use of human judgment and experience, but then you could see um, issues around efficiency, susceptibility to human error, error and bias, and potentially what we've been seeing a lot, um, well, not just in South Africa, in many parts of the world, is um, procurement being a the supply chain process being susceptible to corruption. And if you remove the humans, would you be able to reduce the levels of corruption? So what Aristotle would then get us to think about what is this? Ex what is the golden mean between these two? And perhaps where we could find ourselves is you could use AI as a tool to assist human procurement officers rather than replacing them. And AI can provide the data analysis, it can do a risk, risk assessment, it can provide initial recommendations, which are then reviewed by the human officers who make the final decisions. And then this could co combine, or this process is the sort of happy medium between access and deficiency, but it combines the efficiency and analytical power of AI with the oversight, judgment, and nuance, and experience with experienced procurement of professionals. So this could be what we the framework that we are going to have to be advocating for, that we don't just completely replace the human beings with um, artificial intelligence, but we find this happy middle, and that is going to be really important. So there's possible application for AI in public procurement. I've just, um, in, in many instances, and I've just highlighted a few of where I think AI could be used. So it could be used in various steps of the supply chain process. For example, it could help with planning and I, uh, um, yeah, help with planning and identifying the needs. It could develop comprehensive tender specifications. It can analyze bids based on these tender specifications. It could highlight and draw information about beneficial ownership or tender defaulters. Um, it could assist in project management, providing with projections on completion, risk mitigation, etc. And it might also be able to assist with greater compliance with the open contracting data standards, because if this information is already existing somewhere online on the cloud, they could then be pulled into a central database for people then to access this information. So the possibilities are, you know, are numerous. And I think that we definitely should be encouraging the use of AI in some of these processes in order to reduce some of the human 
um, inefficiencies that we may be seeing or some of the, the, the human biases that are sort of thrown into procurement processes that do make the processes um, susceptible to, to corruption. So, you know, um, going forward, I guess this list is going to keep getting longer as the AI develops and becomes more sophisticated and advanced. But in building these AI systems for procurement, because it's not necessarily that you're going to take a large language model like ChatGPT and then apply that into you know, a public procurement process, these systems are going to have to be developed. Um, and it's going to be fed, it need to be fed with the necessary data and the quality of that data and how that data, what type of data is going to be fed into the system is going to determine whether or not that system is going to be viable for the needs of improving efficiency in public procurement and reducing susceptibility to corruption. And in building these systems, there has to be basic rules that are applied and principles that, 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 um, these systems need to be based on, especially as, as well as the use of these systems. So, for example, transparency is absolutely key and that AI systems decision making, that, that the decision making process is transpa and transparent and understandable to all stakeholders in the supply chain process. So there would need to be a regular audit and clear, clear documentation of these systems and this should be made publicly available and that when AI is used in any point in the supply chain process, it has there has to be a public disclosure of this. So it is important that if AI, if an algorithm is being used to determine whether or not company A gets, gets a tender over company B, this needs to be communicated to those companies. The second principle is accountability and like we said about the sort of golden mean of having that happy medium of using the technology with the human beings is that if you're maintaining a human oversight, then somebody is accountable for the decisions that is being made by the AI system. And this will, you'll need to have clear appeals processes for suppliers who feel unfairly treated by the algorithm. Bias and fairness, so you would constantly need to monitor the AI system to mitigate any biases that may emerge, ensuring fair treatment of all suppliers. And then the last one, last principle is about efficiency and effectiveness. So AI can improve in efficiency and decision making, but it shouldn't be to the detriment of losing of human beings losing their jobs or removing human judgment entirely. So it needs to be, it has to work with, um, AI is not meant to replace, it has to augment and it has to be used as a tool. And in using it as a tool, it has to be clear and transparent and this entire decision-making process when using AI must be um, clear and made publicly available. So I think if we follow those pr processes and principles, we would then be able to find this happy medium between using AI, ensuring that we have uh, professional and ethical public procurement um, personnel in place, and that may then help to reduce vulnerabilities to corruption in um, the supply chain process. So thank you so much for that. I Again, I apologize that for not being there. I really wish that I was. Um, but if you have any, inf uh, have uh, if you do want to engage or if you'd like to learn more about code, uh, you can find information here. You can access our website on www.code-sa.org or you can contact me on email, kavisha at code-sa.org. Thank you. Great. So Kavisha is the only person that you won't have a chance to interact with directly, but I promise you conversation aplenty here. So please do just keep that in mind. And if you would like Kavisha's details, if you didn't catch them um, at the end of that, you can catch me afterwards and I'm happy to connect you to Kavisha um, from the Campaign on Digital Ethics, which is what code stands for. Right, we're going to move on now. Um, and I promise you, for those who do appreciate the visual aids, great, but um, it's you know, after we've done the kind of grounding, we're going to dispense with the PowerPoints and we're going to have a conversation. So keep that in mind and please um, keep your questions, keep your provocations close by. We're moving over to Nati Kafi now, um, who, and in fact, I actually did, I realized I didn't introduce myself, which is really, really bad. <laughs> 
um, very, very bad moderating. <laughs> My name is Zugi Swakota from the Public Service Accountability Monitor um, and also a member of the Open Government Partnership Steering Committee. And I'm happily moderating this fantastic panel. So next is, is Nati, and we're going to, hers is the second presentation that we've got, and she'll be grounding us visually before we open up for conversation. Um, Nati is the Executive Director of, Open, of the Open Data Charter, um, and a fellow member of the Open Government Partnership Steering Committee. But she also has quite a long history in the OGP, or Open Government um, Movement and Open Data Work. But I'll let Nati take over from here, and hers is the second um, presentation. Over to you, Nati. Thank you very much, Suki, and thank you very much uh, for the invitation to the panel. Hi, everybody. Good morning. Um, I know we're all navigating jet lag and just arriving, so thank you very much for being here. I'm going to be as, as, uh, as easy as possible going on, on AI. Um, so I'm, I wanted to share uh, a project in which the, the Open Data Charter um, was part of a, a consortium that, uh, that actually did this. We didn't do any of the work. I don't want to say that we, we are in charge of this. It's actually the Global Center for AI Governance, which is part of a much bigger alliance, which is the Data for Development Alliance, in which the Open Data Charter is a part of. And uh, as we were talking about AI, uh, just last week, uh, a, a signature project was launched by this, this, uh, by this organization, which is the Global Index for Responsible AI. And I thought this would be a very good introduction for the conversations and the examples that our speakers will, will be talking about. So, um, as I said, this is the Global Index on Responsible AI, and you are seeing there that I'm not going to read the definition because you can read it yourselves, but just wanted to share what Responsible AI means for this, this research project. It, it has been a massive research project. 138 countries were researched. Each had its own national research person going through, and I don't want to lie, so I have the numbers here, 1,862 questions uh, around 19 thematic areas and three dimensions. So it's a really comprehensive research project uh, that took a long, long time and a, an incredible team um, that, was, that was led by actually a university based in, in, in South Africa. Um, the questionnaires were, were implemented throughout November of 2023 until February, and then all kind of the, the, um, the inputs were analyzed and, and created uh, this index. So if we can move, ah, I, I need to move, sorry. <laughs> um, well, it's not, it, it doesn't look that clear, but you can see all of this in the, in the webpage anyway. So there's uh, three dimensions that this, this, uh, this research is based on, which have to do with, of course, the, the, um, sorry, the definition of responsible AI. So the idea was to try to understand not only the, the regulatory framework of AI, but also how other organizations outside of government, so civil society organizations, universities, are also part of the conversation around how AI is being deployed in the countries. And the idea around the thematic areas was because there's specific regulations and specific uh, examples that have been deployed in different countries with thematic focus. And so it was interesting to also understand how uh, governance of AI is not just like for the overall conversation, but you can actually take a thematic mirror into how AI should be uh, created and deployed for specific uses, because it might not mean exactly the, the same. Um, and I'm, I'm going to move the, to the next slide, because I wanted to share this. This is uh, basically what I, what I just, uh, what just said, but just to understand the extent of it. Like, this is a really, really big study. Um, there hasn't been a, a study before that, that uh, included as many countries uh, altogether. Um, I'm not going to spoil, uh, I'm actually going to spoil the, the, <laughs> the results, but n there weren't many governments that did very, very good on this. Um, of course, there's countries that are leading the ranking, but there's a lot of work still to do as far as responsible AI uh, goes, and, uh, and we need to actually understand how civil society organizations can also uh, improve our advocacy efforts and our, develop, our own development of, of AI to help uh, with this uh, 
a technology that is just going to keep on growing and being deployed. Um, I'm going to move to the 10 takeaways. So, sorry, I have my notes here. I prepared. Um, so, the, the first takeaway, of course, is that AI governance does not translate into responsible AI. So, even in those cases where the governments have created uh, governance frameworks, it doesn't mean that human rights are in, at the center of, of those, uh, those governance frameworks governance frameworks, which is something that, that this research was looking for. So even those that seem to be doing a, a better job are, are not. <laughs> um, the, other, the other takeaway is that the mechanisms ensuring protection of human rights in the context of AI are limited. So few countries have mechanisms to place pro and protect human rights at risk of AI. Such mechanisms include impact assessments. So there's a lot of countries that do have regulatory frameworks, but impact assessments pre, uh, predecent of the development of, of, of the AI system uh, are non, non-existent in most of them. So it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, then international cooperation, the third takeaway, uh, it's an important cornerstone for the current uh, AI, uh, AI development. So the idea behind this is the importance of uh, forums like UNESCO, IGF, uh, WISIS process in governance frameworks. So principles that are being developed in those international forums, discussions, however you want to call them, are very important and a lot of governments are taking those takeaways as examples. So that, for, for example, for me is very important for us as a civil society organization. So we know who the governments are listening to. So we need to advocate in those forums to get kind of the wording and the conversations and human rights in the center in those forums because governments are actually looking into those recommendations for their own governance uh, frameworks. Um, then something that, of course, we know, but, but it's good to have the data behind it. Gender equality remains a critical gap uh, on responsible AI. We kind of knew about this, but now we have the numbers behind it. Um, despite of the growing awareness around gender, gender issues, and specifically around uh, tech gender issues, there is still uh, a concerning note that most countries do not have a gender kind of lens towards the, uh, their AI governance frameworks. Um, so we also have there a lot of room to, to work on. Um, and following up on that, the fifth, uh, the fifth takeaway goes into inclusion and equity in, in AI. So how are governments uh, and civil society organizations working on that? We still have a lot of room to make. The ranking is not showing a good, a good percentage of regulatory frameworks or AI development, uh, development that, that actually addresses uh, inclusion of, of misrepresented communities. Um, let me go to the next five. Um, then, this is super important that we, we address also, and I think for civil society organizations, there is a lot that we can do as far as advocacy. Uh, workers in AI economies are not adequately protected, so who is developing these uh, algorithms and these uh, AI systems, and how are they protected is super important. It's, it's one of, of the takeaways that I think it's more concerning, uh, because we know that there's a major companies um, I'm yeah, using uh, labor from the global south and there's no regulatory framework to properly protect the workers that are actually developing that. And, uh, and I think there's a lot that we can do as a community actually together uh, to, to work on this. The seventh takeaway is uh, linguistic and cultural diversity of AI. Uh, we've seen it with we've seen it even with open data. Um, it's very important to understand that we need to be able to to actually navigate cultural and linguistic uh, diversity in order to make these AI systems more uh, more inclusive. And uh, and there's a lot of work that that we can do, but also making better connections through the the global South countries. Uh, even within the countries, there's a lot of languages that are being spoken that are not taken into account when developing uh, AI systems, specifically from, from governmental perspective. Um, then this is very concerning, and I, I think this, this will be, we will be coming back to this a lot during any conversations on AI that take place here. Only 38% of the 24, so, sorry, only 38 countries out of the 24th percent of the countries address 
let me get this back. I'm sorry, jet lag. <laughs> Only 38 countries, which is 28% of the countries assessed, have taken steps to address safety, accuracy, and reliability of the AI systems. So there are major gaps to ensure safety and security of the AI systems, which is really concerning. Um, and, uh, and there's a lot of conversations that are happening around cybersecurity that are not specifically connected to the conversations around AI. So we also need to help build uh, bridges between those silos. There, there seem to be communities that are not specifically uh, talking as much as they should, like the cybersecurity people with uh, the AI people. And, and so we need to build those bridges and be able to, to work together better. Then this is something that particularly addresses civil society, and, and it's very important. Universities and civil society organizations seem to be playing a crucial role in, advice, in advancing responsible AI. Mostly universities, so they found out that universities out of civil society, like non-governmental actors, universities are the one taking the lead as far as being advocating and actually preparing proposals for governments to develop more responsible AI frameworks or, or even um, or even developments of, of AI, then civil society, and then there's a, a small percentage of private sector that it's also seen as a good player in this responsible AI uh, vision. And the tenth, and I'm not going to take much longer on this, um, there's still a long way to achieve adequate levels of responsible AI worldwide, which is uh, what I said, there's no, <laughs> the rankings are not that good, uh, so there's a lot of work to do. Um, one of, the, one of the examples that I wanted to share, because I've, uh, I come from, from Latin America, I'm Argentinian, uh, but it's, it's not an example from Argentina, it's actually an example from Chile. So addressing this need for civil society organizations, universities to actually engage, which is something that they, they measure in this, in this index, there's an example in Chile, which I think is a very great example that I wanted to share. So this university got funding to work with the government and they approached the public procurement office um, to help them to see if they wanted, and they said yes, if they wanted to develop a new, um, a new template for how the government would buy AI development to embed ethical principles into that system, into, sorry, into that template, so that the companies that would sell AI developments to the, the government would have to actually address those ethical principles and ethical use of data in the development of, of those AI systems that they were trying to sell to the government. So it's a shift in the conversation because most uh, companies that were trying to sell AI development to the government were like, like they already had the solution, like, you know, this is our AI system, just buy it and do whatever you want with this. But this template actually shifted the conversation. Now the private sector needed to change their algorithm, algorithms and change their AI development framework to actually comply with the new public procurement template. So I think that is a great example on how when government actually wants to get it right, they can. So they, they they were approached by this university. They worked uh, on a kind of interacti interactive way with just two public, sorry, with just two ministries and specific offices within those ministries, so just to check if things were <laughs> working out before they deployed the new the new uh, public procurement template. And it actually worked. And now there's an official new way in which the government uh, opens up calls for tenders. Uh, on AI development. And there's ethical, uh, ethical uses of AI embedded into that, ethical uses of data and privacy protections embedded into, into that uh, public procurement purchase, if you will. So that's, I think it's a great example on how to shift the conversation, uh, how to actually government and civil, in this case a university, can actually collaborate to make things better. So the, it's not, it's, everything is not lost, we can still make change, um, but if you take a deeper look into, into the, the Responsible AI Index, you will find we have a lot of room uh, to, to make changes, and I hope uh, we can get some inputs from, from the examples that are coming up. Thank you very much. Super. 
Wonderful. Thanks for that, Natia. And I think it's a really nice um, link from what uh, Kavisha touched on, particularly around the human rights centric. And I mean, I love your point around we know who the governments are listening to, um, and particularly in the context of public procurement reform, which I think is top of mind um, for for most of us, and and you know across different countries. So, um, without any uh, further wasting of time. Um, our order might have changed a little bit, but um, <laughs> <laughs> next to speak is Nikki. Um, and Nikki is the head of legal and investigations at an amazing organization. All the, all the organizations represented here are amazing, um, but this one is particularly amazing. <laughs> no. Corruption Watch, um, based in South Africa. And um, Nikki will share particularly around uh, a particular tool, digital tool, um, and reflect as well on some of the reflections or some of the explorations that um, uh, Corruption Watch are doing in relation to procurement and, and AI. Um, <laughs> Nikki, you've got the pointer with you? Yes, you've got. Great. Over to you, Nikki. Thanks, Nikki, and good morning to everybody. So, bear with me. This morning, I am discussing using data analytics and AI for smarter anti-corruption efforts, and we will, I'll be presenting a case study from Corruption Watch. So, we have a tool called Procurement Watch, which is a digital tool developed by, by us. Um, and we have been experimenting recently on how we leverage data analytics and artificial intelligence to fight corruption in public procurement. <clears throat> so most likely everybody in this room will know that public procurement is the biggest spender of uh, public funds globally. And it is therefore a system that is a total breeding ground for corruption. This is particularly so when the rules aren't tight and when complex processes, because we all know that procurement is a very complex process, when those complex process, processes are not followed. We have been monitoring public procurement and advocating for reform of South Africa's public procurement system. This is really central to our work at Corruption Watch. Um, procurement integrity is also really central to, um, to the national anti-corruption strategy in South Africa. Forgive me, I'll just have a sip of water. <clears throat> Thank you. So as part of our efforts to advocate for transparency in public procurement, we've developed and launched a digital tool called Procurement Watch. And this tool, what it does, is it aggregates certain kinds of national procurement data. So um, what it does is it takes the data, the, the data that sits in PDF format um, on our National Treasury's website, and it really does make this data easier to search, easier to interpret, and easier to understand. In particular, the tool provides data on deviations, so that's deviations from pre-existing procurement procedures. Um, as well as expansions. So that's expansions on initial terms of um, public contracts. And then it does an analysis on the trends. So for example, it looks at the top 10 values of the deviations and expansions, either for the quarter or for the year. Um, and it identifies government departments most reliant on those high risk modalities of deviations and expansions. So. What our tool essentially does is it tackles a major challenge, and that is just the sheer volume of procurement data. So with over 15,000 entries on one of those PDFs, it can be incredibly overwhelming for a researcher to gain meaningful <coughs> insights. Um, and, and really what Procurement Watch does is it really just cuts through that noise. We then take this data, we, once it's gone through our system, we put it into quarterly reports or an annual report, as the case may, may be, and then we engage with our stakeholders about what we find. So, Procurement Watch... There we go. Um, procurement Watch analyzes retrospective data. Uh, for the quarter of the year gone by, as I've mentioned, and it, then it, potential, it flags potential 
uh, corruption that may have taken place through the deviations and expansions. So in recent times, we started to explore how we could potentially expand the work we do through Procurement Watch using AI to be predictive in nature. Um, so we can really be more proactive instead of reactive with working with government departments in our counter-corruption efforts. Um, in our first experiment, we wanted to identify departments likely to overuse contract expansions in the year to come. So, and once these departments have been identified, we can then, as a goal, um, proactively engage with the department um, and to work with them in driving the need home for open procurement processes. So what our data analysts did here um, was to create a basic model uh, using Excel to identify departments to, for targeted outreach. And we asked about their reliance on contract expansion as a modality. We, when I say we, our data analysts, <laughs> they fed it into Gemini, which is a large language model. Um, they put in seven years of data on departmental contract, uh, contract expansions. And then Gemini um, attempted um, a prediction using linear regression. And that was based on the seven years of data, as I've mentioned. Um, and one of the examples that I can give you is um, based on, is, is ESCOM, which is, um, some people may have read about, is South Africa's ailing uh, electricity provider. And it predicted that ESCOM would deviate from 48 contracts between 2024 and 2025. What we found really interesting about this process, though, was, was the fact that Gemini also highlighted its own limitations um, on its predictions. So, so it said that limitations included the fact that fluctuations in some departments' expansion usage um, made linear models unreliable. Um, it also um, set out the fact that additional data, like, like the reasons for increases, um, were needed for a much more nuanced understanding of what was going on. So, while Gemini couldn't provide definitive predictions, it offered valuable insights for us. Um, it provided, firstly, what was quite interesting for us is that it provided the code in Python, which was really were good for us because that's what our, our tool, um, procurement tool uses. Um, it listed the, the limitations of using linear regression. So, if it didn't offer a solution without, so it didn't offer a solution without highlighting its shortcomings, and it also gave us the new, uh, new perspective on the need for qualitative research um, alongside our data analyst um, analysis. So the next experiment that we did was trying to predict poor audit outcomes. So what we did was we assigned a, a scoring system to audit results, and we then fed Gemini data on um, past audit outcomes for various departments. So while Gemini offered predictions on which departments would have qualified or unqualified audits, it also suggests, again, it suggested improvements, which was very interesting. Um, it said that more historical audit data could enhance accuracy and additional data points like staff vacancies um, and financial indicators might be more valuable. So what we then did um, to take it further is that, which we tried to follow its advice, we incorporated financial health data from our Auditor General's reports um, and and a list of high-impact auditees. So this combined approach allowed us to prioritize government departments for further monitoring in future, um, and it really just pointed us in the right direction as to who we needed to engage with um, and who we needed to improve um, in terms of who needed to improve their governance. Um, our lessons, lessons learned for us, <coughs> Um, is that AI is an amazing tool. 
It's a powerful tool. We encountered um, limitations uh, like Gemini's preempting data input and the need for more refined data um, sets for accurate predictions. It also taught us that the right tool for the job matters. So while AI um, holds some promise for us, sometimes a simpler approach, like Excel models, is also as effective. Mm -hmm. it, and the, it also taught us that continuous learning is key. So we're constantly exploring ways to refine our data and analysis and our A AI applications. So, so just in conclusion, these, these experiences highlight the value of data analytics and AI in anti-corruption efforts. And um, by combining these AI tools with traditional methods, um, Corruption Watch is working towards a future of transparent and, and accountable public procurement in South Africa. Thanks, Suki. Yeah, super. Great. Thanks, Nikki. Um, and I especially like, I mean, I think given our civil society focus to some extent, resource constraints are very real. And so the ability to use AI um, and specific tools to kind of prioritize your interventions and advocacy um, areas is, is fantastic. Um, so just a, another sort of heads up to everyone. Um, we're going to have Karabo, who's going to speak to us just now, who's um, a manager, country manager um, uh, from Open Ownership. Uh, Karabo's going to speak just now. Uh, but what I do want to just give everyone a heads up to is that I'm going to vacate my seat very soon. Um, and the reason I'll vacate my seat, depending on our time, is because um, we really would like you know, interaction from the audience, but I'll explain that just now. So just get yourself warmed up to potentially get up, join us, raise a question from the floor. I'm warning you in advance, um, just before we let, uh, we give the floor to Karabo. Uh, her presentation is the fourth one on our list. And soon after that, we will open up for kind of, um, you know, direct engagement. Over to you, Karabo. Thanks. Thanks so much, Soki. I feel like I'm standing between you and a really engaging discussion. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I think the, the, this presentation, I think, nicely sort of ends off where the discussion has gone from thinking about the policy and ethical considerations to thinking about what we've learned about the use of AI. My presentation is going to be orientated towards thinking about what are the dependencies and considerations for using AI in order to get the kinds of impact in tackling corruption. I'll be looking at it from the lens of beneficial ownership transparency, so um, ownership transparency, and thinking about how AI can facilitate the use and impact in tackling financial crime. I think we all know the classic example of the money launderer <laughs> using various shell companies to... Can we just have a mic check? There we go. Yeah, could I, I think just hold on a bit while we sort out um, your sound. continue to focus on the money launderer as we <laughs> Good? Much better, thank you. So I think we, we know the classic image of the, the money launderer who uses anonymous shell companies to hide their ill-gotten gains in, in tax havens. Whilst that still holds true, I think what we're seeing is that it's not just us sitting in the room thinking about the use of AI to tackle corruption or financial crime, but so too are the financial criminals thinking about how to use the very same technologies for the same use. And so to some extent, I think AI has the potential to scale the use and impact of beneficial ownership data by enabling investigators, civil society governments to be able to, to some extent, stay ahead of the curve of where these risks lie in society. And this is important because what we know is that in 70% of grand corruption cases, anonymously owned companies have been used to facilitate these types of behavior. We also know that in three out of four um, foreign bribery cases, intermediaries, including corporate vehicles, are used to really facilitate this kind of illicit behavior. In the African context, I think it's 86 billion US dollars are lost every year in illicit financial flows, and part of that is facilitated by not knowing who owns and controls companies. And so we understand the scale of the problem. And so thinking about AI, thinking about how we can use this new technology to really tackle the nature of this risk. 
Now, there have been, um, there, there's a growing development around the use of technology to tackle financial crime, including in procurement or in tax and so forth. And what we're seeing is various international standards, be it the Financial Action Task Force, are really thinking about what can technology do to really unlock the full impact of these types of disclosures. What we're also seeing is that a growing number of national governments are thinking about how to begin to use these technologies in ways that can really scale their ability to conduct these types of investigations. And I think two things are happening at the national level. On the one hand, we're beginning to see the positive impact of these kinds of technologies, but we're also beginning to see some of the drawbacks and the risks of these types of technologies being used. The, um, the UNODC did a study looking at the use of beneficial ownership data and its implementation in, in southern Africa, looking both at how to enable the development of registers, but also looking at how investigators can really begin to use these types of um, tools and technology to enhance their work. They very helpfully mapped out some of the advantages and disadvantages for these 11 countries which they, which they are currently working with. Some of it, I think, um, Nafi, you covered and thinking about um, some of the data privacy risks around it, the cost and resources. But I think on the plus side, they really saw the opportunity around can we scale the kind of investigations which are currently taking place um, within our various government agencies. Because I think this has been covered to some extent, I'm not going to go into this detail unless it comes through during the course of discussions. It's this point over here, there's one thing that I'd like to leave this group with um, from today is this. AI has got the ability to really scale impact and use, but the benefits of, of artificial intelligence or um, big language learning or, or machine learning and so forth is really dependent on getting the basics, the fundamentals right. And to this extent, having data standards is what really enables the collecting and exchanging of information for use and impact and allows, I think sometimes you talk about the fancy investigation, the fancy sort of analysis work to really take place. It also means that some of the cost and expense and duplication is avoided by having the fundamentals and having the basics right about around this. At Open Ownership, we're responsible for the development and maintaining and improvements to the beneficial ownership data standard, which is a data standard that allows for the mapping, the collection, and storage of ownership data in a way that allows for data to be shareable and used by a variety of data users. It also overall improves the quality of data which is held by registries in order to enable those who want to use the data for impact to be able to effectively use it. The other important aspect around having a data standard is that we know with these types of financial crimes um, is that it's not just a national problem, often there's a transnational link to these kinds of investigations. And so having structured data across a number of jurisdictions allows for these transnational links to be made in order to really undertake the kind of investigations to understand who did what and how that can be avoided in the future. And this really allows for, I think, a growing area of, area of work and consideration about how do you create interoperable registers which allow for these transnational links to be made. What we've seen in terms of the, the benefits of having structured data, and this is related to beneficial ownership data, but I think to Nikki's point around having good quality data which can then be analysed without the kinds of gaps or, um, or areas which are sometimes picked up with the underlying data structures are not correct, is that high quality data really supports the detailed risk-based analysis. The example that you see on your screen, I can see it right in front of me, is a particular study which was undertaken by a Nordic country together with the IMF to understand how to predict which countries might be high risk in terms of certain types of financial crimes. And so being able to use some kind of high quality data, these types of risks over time were, were able to be identified. The second example, I think, and we're seeing this across a number of jurisdictions, is that where there is structured data, it enables some of these other really important use cases to be, um, to be unlocked. And so a crucial one, and I think Nikki really well articulated this, is around the use of bio data and procurement to understand who the people are or the politically exposed persons are who are getting contracts or, get, or, or involved in procurement processes in ways that harms integrity or the democracy of these particular processes. Um, it's often also combined with sanctions or politically exposed persons, particularly when looking at questions around anti-money laundering or financial crimes. 
And then lastly, the, there's a growing importance of being able to link ownership data to so who the natural persons are behind certain corporate vehicles with the fuller ownership chain. And so again, having structured data, the fundamental building blocks in place, is essential to be able to then leverage this in terms of then doing that um, more wide-scale analysis and learning using AI and other tools. Another risk which we have seen, and I think this is a particular example that our tech team has been doing with a commercial provider called Graphaway. And one risk that often arises when it comes to ownership structures is the use of circular ownership structures. Now, this doesn't necessarily mean that there is definitely a crime that's being committed, but it's often a way in which um, ownership is concealed by essentially making it very difficult to track who's ultimately behind a company or trust. And so this particular um, tool allows for structured beneficial ownership data which open ownership has generated to be combined with other data sources to be able to then visualize what are we actually looking at um, as something which can then detect a particular risk or point towards a place which requires further investigation. So again, the ability to create these kinds of visualizations combined with other data sources is pretty, is, um, is grounded in the ability of that data to be high quality and structured data. Lastly, before I close, I thought it would be important just to think about what does having structured data look like in different contexts, to avoid the question of, but can this work in different contexts and what does this mean? So the beneficial ownership data standards has been adopted or is being adopted by a variety of countries globally, including the United Kingdom. Canada has made commitments and are making some progress around it. But there are also countries in the African region who are making progress around the use of the beneficial ownership data standard. And what's important about this is that they're not simply using the data standard for the sake of it, but they're trying to answer a problem in order to solve for something else. So Nigeria, which is the first country in Africa which has adopted the beneficial ownership data as a data standard for their register, is using the data standard for, I think, three purposes. The one is that they want to be able to publish high quality data in their public register to allow for government, civil society to be able to use this data. The second reason is because they want to be able to link their national data with international data sources to really facilitate those types of investigations. The third area which we're beginning to see the use of beneficial ownership data from their register is for law enforcement and competent authorities to undertake the investigations. And so we're seeing some really interesting use cases coming out of their financial intelligence center saying that now that we're able to access this data using an API, we can begin the analysis work. In Namibia, um, they have making the decision to use a beneficial ownership data standard to solve the problem of they'd identified in their context that it wasn't sufficient just to understand who's behind companies in their jurisdictions, but they also wanted to know who the natural people are behind trust structures, which were identified as high risk um, in, their, um, in their national risk assessment when they identified that in one of their sort of large corruption scandals, which some of you might be familiar with, fish rot, the use of trust structures and the, the people behind them were a particular vehicle of choice used in that, their context. And so Namibia said, we are going to create registers for companies and trusts, but we also want to ensure that data users, particularly law enforcement and competent authorities, won't have to go through a difficult process of going to various registries to be able to access this data about who's behind these, these, these particular corporate vehicles. And so they adopted the beneficial ownership data standard to ensure that their company and trust registers are interoperable so that data users have a single view of a corporate structure overall. In Botswana, the, the journey there has been slightly different. They had an existing digital register, and as part of improvements to their use of digital technologies, they made the decision to say, we are going to use the beneficial ownership standard as the next phase of innovation around our particular implementation journey. So I think what these three examples show is that in different contexts, this makes sense because it provides a solution to a problem which has got very national particularities, but leverages on international learnings and processes as well. In closing, I think it's important to say at the start, we spoke about how artificial intelligence can be used to have scale and impact. 
but it also can be used, I think, to provide the kinds of analysis which are required to really stay ahead of the kinds of innovations to the types of illicit behavior, financial crime, corruption that we currently see. But I think we're on a journey of really learning about what it looks like in different types of contexts. And I think the kinds of investigations, the kinds of use cases which will come out of these types of um, these contexts, but also these kinds of these types of contexts are going to be really helpful in getting us to understand what is the way that these te technologies con can continue to be leveraged in a way that doesn't cause further harm. In our own work looking at the beneficial ownership data standard, we've gone through various iterations of it and through learning about how implementation happens and learning about what needs to be captured in terms of understanding complete um, ownership structures. We've also made our own progressions in terms of being able to capture new types of relationships, be it nominee arrangements, be it thinking about how trusts are captured, or thinking about corporate vehicles in, when it comes to publicly listed companies are captured in the standard, and also thinking about how to capture um, changes over time as critical to being able to have the right type of data for the types of investigations that are needed. So I suppose from my presentation, it's not so much an either or, an ally or an enemy, but it's thinking about what are the considerations and dependencies for you know, ensuring that this type of technology can have the kind of impact for tackling the risks that we see in our societies. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Karabo. Thanks for that input. Um, so yeah, neither ally nor enemy, neither friend nor foe, um, which I guess is really what makes it quite a complex context. So now, as I promised, okay, we've got just just um, under half an hour um, in which you know space. I really am hoping that we might get some questions from the floor, but also very keen to get any you know alternative perspectives, any provocations. Um, the panel, I promise you, are thick-skinned, um, and so if you actually have any aspects where you say, actually, I don't quite agree, this is why, um, very welcome, given that the AI space, as we've said, is one that's developing, one that's complex, one that's dynamic. So we have a hand, are you, are you, you're completely welcome to join on the stage, or you can speak from the floor, it's entirely up to you. Just give us quickly who you are, and let's hear. Thank you. Thank you so much. So my name is Carolis. I'm with Open Contracting Partnership. And I, I thought, you know, us being in Lithuania, and I'm local, I'll give you a fun fact to the point of uh, Carabo, mm -hmm. um, that not only us need to learn AI, but also criminals are learning AI. And what's happening here right now, it's actually on the front page of the national paper, is, you know, we have a minister resigned because she took a private jet to uh, Dubai to celebrate her birthday with a criminal. Apparently that criminal now owns a company that uh, is in charge of all governmental financial transactions. So when I speed, I have to pay a fine. So I pay a fine through that system. Now, the, the story there is interesting. So he has a history already. So he's been already detained. He served his sentence in prison for years, a financial you know, crook and all of that. So he changed so many companies and that worked for him. At some point, we got the systems right. We tried companies and that's not bad. So the guy got smarter. He changed his name. And then his company won a contract, and then without him being linked to the company, and then only he joined the company after having a contract. Now, we found that data only after political scandal erupted. So nobody identified it, but political opposition you know, started sniffing uh, around and, and identified that. And that shows you know, to the point that we have to have that data in automatic way, structured, standardized, accessible at all times, because otherwise it's being used as a manipulation very often to uh, fight political uh, fights, and that's a problem. A question to Nati, if I may. Uh, Chile, uh, the example in Chile, was it? Yeah. It's great, and I think there are some other examples there. The question to you, do you see any emerging guidance for governments to implement those kind of principles? Because probably it's not the most easiest thing for a government to find out example from Chile and deep dive you know, into it. And I'm wondering, you know, who's leading the, the charge here? Like any organization taken? the responsibility to do it. Thank you. Thank you. Sure, fantastic. Really great to hear a local example. That's fascinating. So should we, um, Karabo, if you've got any input on that, any reflections, and Nati um, to, on that question, go for it, and then we'll open up again. Just to say extremely well said. 
and I think really underscores the point of having good structured data and doing that type of analysis. So straight over to you, Nati. Um, so not that I know of, and that's why I'm sharing an example that the Open Data Charter wasn't even involved with, because I found it such an amazing way to actually have a conversation on how, because governments are going to buy AI systems or developments. They are going to do it, like they are actually doing it right now. So can, how can we embed ethics and ethical use of, of data and ethical development of those systems within the public procurement system? And that's a great example. Um, fortunately, there's, at least in Latin America, there, there seems to be a momentum right now, an organization like between universities sharing examples on ethical AI systems and this example is one of the kind of biggest ones of course um, so once again global collaboration at least regional collaboration there seems to be the, the way um, and and I think this example is also has also been showcased in a regional meeting on public procurement so it's just like spreading the word and letting everybody know that things can be done like it's not that that the fight against like the big companies that develop AI is lost there's, there's a way. If, if there's a will, there's a way. And it's, I think it's for us, for civil society organizations, um, it's places like this and international forums is a way of advocating and letting everybody know that there's examples of, of, things, um, of things going right. Of course, there's always going to be problems, but this is a great, great example. So not, not that I know of. I wish I had a more positive answer. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Thanks for that, Nati. Um, any other reflections, questions, examples? Um, and again, you're completely welcome to take to um, the stage um, to share your examples with, um, with our panel. Okay, yes, we've got a hand over here. Thank you. Uh, Elansha, DLA Piper. Um, I was... Uh, You've had two com completing, uh, competing uh, talks at the same time, so I've been nipping in and out. But uh, I uh, really was uh, uh, really like Nikki's talk about Gemini and using um, AI for audits. And I saw that you were looking at the financial processes to spot the, the uh, money transfers and things like that. And I wondered whether any of you had experience in using neural net AI to spot the behavioral issues. So we've been working. Um, it, within a law firm to spot the behavioral risks that regulators would spot in unstructured data like email and communications and just wondered whether you had any experience of that and uh, and how successful you found it. Nice. A, Go for it, Nikki. Yeah. Thanks. That's a great question. Um, we sort of fairly early on in our experimental stages and um, that's the next thing that we're going to tackle. So I'd love to get your contact details and um, we'll let you know what we find. Great. We have an off-the-shelf product, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Great. That's, I think I love this, this spirit of sharing, which hopefully um, we can continue throughout um, the session and throughout the, the conference. Um, any, anyone else? Yes, please go for it. We've... Hi, Louise Russell Pravata from Open Ownership as well, um, but I'm not actually going to talk about beneficial ownership. Thanks so much for a really interesting panel. Um, simple question, not sure it has a simple answer. How do you square um, the complexity of uh, like AI models and how they operate um, with the uh, point that was made earlier on the need to have accountability if, for example, a company feels like they've been incorrectly assessed? Um, I know there's not great examples on things like social welfare coming out of the US um, on uh, AI assessment of like benefits and social welfare claims and things. So I wonder what we can learn from that in this sector to prevent the same sort of biases happening again. Thanks. Wow. Mm. Glad I'm not a panelist. <laughs> I don't know if anyone wants to take that and we go back to the floor. My, I don't think there is, a, as, as you said, one, one proper answer. and. Mm. We, um, we do have examples of, of things gone wrong. I think one of the, one of the takeaways of, of, of the index is actually that there's not enough um, readiness assessments. So before you are deploying, like how, how, how do we uh, try to check as much as possible, study that, that uh, negative impact as much as possible before we actually deploy the, the AI system? I think that's, that's kind of the answer that I could give right now. And then also, I think there's, there's um, and this is for the lawyers, I'm not a lawyer, but 
Um, there's also things in like the public procurement contracts uh, around who is ultimately uh, responsible for that. Like if, if it was a private company that developed that system for uh, a government, like is the government 100% to be, to, to be um, accused of that? Is the private company, like who, there's still struggles around that, that, that conversation, but um, I think we will unfortunately see developments in the upcoming months and years like in the short term on cases like that, that will start to teach us um, no's, <laughs> ways not to do it. Yeah, and there's likely as well something to be, to be said for that kind of Aristotle's golden mean example that, um, that Kavisha should, shared earlier on. And I think, yeah, you're right. It is a complex question, but certainly one I think that is worth considering when we talk about not entirely removing human judgment. Um, but where exactly is that? Where is, where is that sweet spot um, is maybe the complex um, um, aspect. I'm keeping a close eye on the time. I did promise to be sure that we, we, kept, it, um, we kept it tight. Any, anyone else with any provocations? There's a hand. Oh, I'm sorry. There's Will. Hi, uh, Ross Clark from the Enhancing Accountability Program in South Africa. Thanks for the great presentations. I mean, a constant theme throughout all these discussions, I think it's all about the quality of the data. That's the starting point. That's the foundation. But that's clearly not the shiny object, right? We're not here talking about those fundamentals. And I think in many parts of the world, there are major gaps, right? We know this. So just any thoughts on where there is that investment in the basic and getting that quality data or any uh, tools for government so they can make that assessment first. Is their data good enough before they can leap to AI-enabled uh, support and tools in this space? Thank you. Yeah, a really important. Should we come back this way? Okay, I'm, I'm going to stop directing because I think it's better that the mic handler does, does what she needs to do. Um, so we'll take the next hand. I, I wanted to answer that question because there was a hand over there, so I jumped in before uh, that. So see. maybe can, um, you can come back to me later because I don't want to jump in. Great. Before. You're also welcome to join the stage if you'd like. <laughs> Thank you um, for the great presentations. My name is Mata Sufako from the Office of the Public Protector in South Africa. Um, Nikki, I'm very interested in the procurement watch um, framework that you spoke on. I wanted to find out when you did the study with ESCOM, uh, was it in cooperation with ESCOM? How was it received and how do you think the general public service or public administration will receive um, such interventions from you um, going forward. Thank you. Thanks, Matao. I'm going to ask you to hold on to that, Nikki. Um, okay, I think, that, was there a hand here again? Somewhere? No, there wasn't. And a hand there? No. Okay, great. So we can come back to the answer you were going to share and then come back to the to the to the um, fishbowl. Thank Thanks. you. <laughs> I think it's such a good question and I wanted to address that with a very specific example. So at Open Contracting Partnership we developed something that's called Cardinal which is a red flagging tool but it's not about just giving red flags and, and calculating but it's from the angle of assessing the quality, completeness, structure and standards of data to be able to power those red, uh, red flags. So any government can take, you know, there's a list of red flags and they give us their data sets and we can run the checks and say, well, you have quality issues, you have this and that. And, and it's not about this example or this tool exactly, but it's about the, the approach. Governments are not particularly great at that approach because they think in terms of tools. They want to buy a tool and they just start there. They don't think about what Nikki said, which was a right tool for the right job, right? So there's no design thinking there too much because they purchase tools and not the problem uh, solution to the problem. So it's the whole shift in mindset I think we should be working towards where government should be asking questions, what is it that we want to know as opposed to what is it that we want to build or buy, you know? And then based off that, the data quality checks are doable or data quality structure and everything else uh, are doable. And taken from there, I think we can develop some kind of frameworks in terms of the approach, but we're very, very far away from that point yet. Great, thanks for that. So yes, 
go for it. I um, have a note on the on the question about data quality. So I'm the ED of the Open Data Charter. We work on, on open data and we help governments and civil society organizations through their openness uh, journeys. And of course, we like I, I, I pretty much speak all the time about the, how the, anything that has to do with AI is actually the first conversation that we need to have is around data. And that's the backbone. And with digital public infrastructure is the same, like we're talking about data and then we, are, we can speak about this. So one of the things that we did, and, and you can follow up then with, with Renato, who's here, he's the research director, the beard uh, guy that is sitting here in the front. Uh, we did a research project on trying to understand if there's such thing as high value data sets for AI into, into thematic areas, so health and, uh, and agriculture. And we actually did this research in 12 countries um, in Latin America and Africa. Um, and, and so we, are, we haven't published the final report yet, so I cannot spoil it. But uh, there's, there's, of course, uh, a conversation to have around open data and, and AI and how like, it can actually help with, with the development of, of AI tools that can help for advocacy or even red flags. Uh, but then also, as part of our international advocacy, we are participating in the discussions of the Global Digital Compact, uh, which is the digital com like document that is going to come out of the Summit for the Future in the UN. And that's where we're advocating the, for the conversation around data, open data, and how that's embedded there, because there's a lot around AI, but we're forgetting the data conversation. So mm -hmm. e every interaction that I've had in that uh, in that. Um, in that forum, in, that, in those conversations, I'm actually talking about that. And we need more civil society organizations speaking about this. So if you want to join <laughs> that, that, those discussions, um, bringing back the conversation down to data. It's important to talk about AI. It's import important to talk about digital public, public infrastructure. But we're forgetting about the data that is behind it. So let's collaborate, please. <laughs> yeah, go for it, Carabo. Yeah. Um... One, just on the, the data quality question and are governments interested in improving the underlying data, I would reframe that to say that I think what we're seeing is that open ownership, we focus quite heavily on the implementation side, so working with national governments to help them um, get beneficial ownership data online, but also make it available to data users. And I think what we're seeing with the maturing of the space is that the more interaction there is between an implementing agency who's responsible for the beneficial ownership register and those who need to use the data, the more the discussion becomes about if we want to use this beneficial ownership data for procurement or if we want to use this beneficial ownership data to tackle financial crime as an FIU. We have certain requirements in terms of what that data needs to look like and that's driving the improvement of quality. So it's not just a um, corporate registries who are sort of sitting quietly in their offices thinking we must improve our data quality, but that really being driven by data users saying this is the use case for what you're um, collecting and that helping make it a much more sort of grounded discussion around how can we improve the quality of, of data. So I think that that's one side of it. I think the, the other part of it is it's, it's improvements over time. And so I think that there was sort of the initial phase of implementation, which was just about, let's get beneficial ownership data online. We want to understand who the natural persons are behind these corporate vehicles that are operating in our societies. But as the, as the space matures around thinking about the importance of corporate ownership transparency, so is the conversation around what does quality look like beginning to mature as well. And so it's shifted from just being, let's have a really decent legal framework to thinking quite carefully of what, what is data verification in our space, how to ensure that change over time is adequately reflected, how to begin linking this data to other data sets. And so I think there's a growing um, maturity and also countries sort of peer influencing each other to say, if we are able to make progress, so too can, can I make progress in certain contexts. An example which really comes to mind in terms of this is Kenya, where our teams are doing some work with the procurement authority there and one of the first things that they did was to say from the existing data sets both um, contracting data and beneficial ownership data from a user perspective be it you being as an anti-corruption commission or procurement official working around some kind of analysis 
if we look at the data which is currently available, is it even usable? And that being a driving point to really help with thinking about, okay, so what does quality look like in this particular context? So I think there are signs of the desire for um, higher quality, but I think it's how that conversation is driven, which is really essential and grounding that around users as opposed to just saying high quality for the sake of it. Yeah, thanks, Karaba. Nikki, on the ESCOM question. Such a great question. Um, only half of the work is done by the time we, you know, input the data, we clean the data, we look at it, analyze it, report, uh, report on it. Um, for us, the big part of what we do and why we use procurement watch, the procurement watch tool is the engagement with organs of state on those findings. And it's an absolutely critical, critical step. Um, so we have over the last, I would say last year, spent a tremendous amount of time engaging with um, organs of state like the Auditor General, uh, the Treasury, the SIU for, for specific red flags. Um, it's only in recent times that we've started to unpack and stretch the legs of AI to see what we would find in, from a pre um, uh, preemptive perspective. And of course, our modus operandi is to engage with organs of state. So as and when those findings come up, we'll most certainly be engaging um, with them to see how we can really advocate for open public procurement. Great. Thanks. Thanks, Nikki. And I think that sort of multi-stakeholder, multi-entity approach is, is something that very, you know, is, is very needed, particularly in, in this work and in procurement in particular. Um, so I think with that, I, I did promise our organizers, as I said, that we would um, keep it tight. If there isn't one last question, we can afford one last question. Great. What I will ask now um, is just um, parting shots from our panel. I think we have already kind of picked up on this notion that it was overly simplistic to have this friend or foe, um, ally or, 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 or enemy approach. But I think to tease out those complexities, it was quite a useful sort of framing, um, playful as it was. So um, should we go in the reverse order this time? I suppose it's not really reverse. We'll just go, let's go this way. Um, <laughs> parting shots um, and, and before we say goodbye to everyone, thank you so much again just for interacting and, and for, for being here. So we'll go, Nikki, and we'll go this way. Parting two, shots. Two sentences from my side. We need good quality data, and for that we need to advocate. We need to work um, through our multi-stakeholder partnerships, um, and we need to work with our organs of state um, in getting what we need. Um, and the second thing is use the tools that we have, use what's appropriate for the job at the time. Thanks. Nikki took all my words. <laughs> in, in my presentation, I said the one thing that I would like this room to take away is the importance of having the fundamentals right to be able to use these technologies, and I still hold to that, that getting the building blocks right around having structured data, having high quality data, really incorporating user needs and thinking about what that looks like is going to be essential to the benefits of AI and other technologies. But I really like Nikki's point around sometimes doing simple like an Excel spreadsheet is also as effective. So not moving away from that. And then I would be remiss if I didn't um, also mention that we have just um, completed a zero to zero point four of the beneficial ownership data standard, which will be launched next week, I think on the 25th. And so I would invite you all to attend that because I think there's some really interesting solutions which have been thought about through that, um, the latest iteration of our data standard. Okay, t tough to add something to, to that. I'm, I'm, I'm just gonna talk about maybe the importance of collaboration. Mm -hmm. um, it's not just governments, it's not just civil society organizations, it's not just universities, it's not just citizens, we need to, to collaborate. And, um, and adding to that, um, OGP, the Open Government Partnership, can be, it has a methodology of collaboration. It actually entails uh, that every member has a multi-stakeholder forum, so maybe conversations can be um, kind of driven through, through that process and, and how OGP can also be a, a driver for, for these conversations so that we make uh, AI an, an ally. Fantastic, yeah. Um, and on that note, so I, as I mentioned, from an organization called the Public Service Accountability Monitor in South Africa, and we work um, actually 
more or less with, with all of these organizations on the stage at some level. Um, but my other hat is as, as um, a steering committee member of the, of the Open Government Partnership. And I think just to close on that aspect around the issue of collaboration, um, really would encourage everyone to take a look um, at some of the OGP um, offerings, in particular the Open Gov Challenge, in which digital governance is one aspect. Um, and I think certainly what we are grappling with I think not just in the context we speak of, but I think it is a global issue, a global aspect, is precisely how to leverage you know, issues of digital tech, issues of AI, kind of to really meaningfully in the context of digital governance beyond the fancy wording. Um, uh, and so really, I would uh, encourage that, and that would be my call to action and my encouragement. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I hope the rest of the conference is amazing. Um, and and uh, yeah, let's give a hand of applause to what I felt was a really great, Panel. Thank you.